Hello, everyone. I am excited to be joined by Director of the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office, Jigger Shaw, and Chief Customer Officer at Smart Energy Water, Darren Brady. Thank you guys for joining today. How are y'all doing? Great. Awesome. So we're going to be discussing how new types of financing can offer greater access to clean energy. Um, but before we really get into that discussion, Jigger, can you explain a little bit about what the Loan Programs Office is and the work that y'all do? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, the, the original vision for the Loan Programs Office was recognizing that we have an extraordinary innovation track record here at the Department of Energy. And so we have a lot of technologies that make it through the innovation process and get to a status of being proven um, that never really reach full commercialization, right? And so the Loan Programs Office is really here to try to bridge that, uh, you know, sort of build that bridge to bankability and really help folks get across, you know, first of a kind deployment, um, you know, engineering excellence, sort of second through 10th deployment. And then you've got a learning curve, right? Where you have incremental innovations as you get the cost down. And then you've got full market acceptance, right? Which around like securitization by Wall Street and things like that. And so we have programs in all four of those milestones uh, across um, our Title 17 programs, which uh, do a lot of project finance, right? Think solar, wind, and uh, virtual power plants, hydrogen, nuclear. Um, and then we've got the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program where Tesla got their loan and Ford and Nissan. And then you've got the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program where we've had a huge amount of success in getting a lot of tribes interested in participating in deployment, uh, deployment of assets. And so that's been um, a real uh, fun effort. Yeah, it sounds like an exciting time to be at the helm of uh, you know, a place that can actually bring some of these projects to fruition. So that's awesome. Um, Darren, you're, uh, you've been in the industry for a while and actually worked at utilities in the past. So can you talk a little bit about how the, the equity conversation has changed in this industry over the years as you've seen it? Absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. It's great being here. And Jigger, thank you so much for being a part of our session as well. It's great to have you be part of We Three. You know, that's a great question, Aaron. I mean, and obviously, could spend the whole 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 session here just talking about it. But I think kind of taking a broad view. You know, when you look at customer related priorities in the energy and water industry, and kind of that conversation that's now happening around equity, it, as always, it tends to be a journey, right? It takes a series of steps to get there. And I think if you look at this topic, maybe five plus years ago, the conversation would have been still focused around kind of the rate making process, customer advocacy groups, bill and assistance, energy assistance programs like LIHEAP, energy efficiency programs like weatherization activities, and then third parties to help facilitate that. So think of it more as a very targeted, very programmatic. But, but I think if you fast forward to today and you look at the last couple of years, that's what's happened with the pandemic and the impact that's had on underserved communities. And now the growing focus and prioritization around climate sustainability goals. I think this equity con the equity conversation has now moved beyond the rate making process into leadership teams, boardrooms, city councils to really take a greater prioritization around ways to address it. Um, you know, across the utility industry and even more broadly across that as well. I think EVs, right? So what's driving some of that? I think the electric vehicle rollout, the infrastructure associated with that is making a, an important impact on kind of how to make sure those types of areas are created accessibility for customers across different communities. Um, location accessibility is very important in that area and that's helping with, it's making a big impact on that conversation because it's driving that in many cases. I also think just from an industry perspective, a critical aspect in the conversation is making sure as an industry, we are working across all the stakeholder groups, right? We're engaging across the communities, community leaders, to create that equal access to make sure we're doing what is right to provide accessibility to all customers for these different solutions. I'm seeing progress, right? I mean, I think of where I was, where it was five years ago to where we are today. I think we've seen really good progress in the conversation, but we have a lot of work to do, right? When we look at rolling out new technologies, energy solutions, the goal for success on a broad basis to achieve these goals is to make sure it's accessible to all people. So we're moving in the right direction, but we've got work to do. Yeah, so you mentioned new technologies and 
this is where we want to get into virtual power plants a little bit. Um, so as I understand, virtual power plants are basically decentralized energy management systems. So how, Jigger, how can virtual power plants, how do they relate to this equity conversation and how can they help bring clean energy to those who haven't really had access to it before now? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I think that part of uh, what I would say um, to the previous question is also, I think there's a level of intentionality um, that's there today that, you know, maybe not, wasn't really there, you know, five or 10 years ago. And I think the virtual power plant area is a place where we can really be intentional. So when you think about electric vehicle rollouts, or you think about heat pump rollouts, or you think about solar plus storage, um, I think, you know, there is a uh, sort of a triggering mechanism by which you get people's interest, right? You know, public safety shutoffs, folks want battery backup or diesel generators or something to make sure they can ride through that, particularly folks who have essential health needs on the electrical side, right? So whether it's CPAP machines or other things. And, um, and what it turns out is that if you have a battery and that battery is used properly within um, an overall software package, it can actually act like a natural gas peaker plant for the rest of the grid all year, right? So what happened for a long time is that there were these programs in the past where people would say, we wanna be able to turn down your thermostat in an emergency situation, right? Well, it turns out there's a lot of people who are willing to get a 50% discount on their electricity bill, right? It, to be that flexible all year round, every single day, right? We'd be, we'd be, we'd be happy for you to shift um, our air conditioner so that it runs during the daytime when there's sufficient solar power. And that during that duck curve, you know, part of the day, um, it, it stays off, right? Same thing's true with electric vehicle charging, right? When you look at what charging patterns have been, um, during COVID, which admittedly was a special time, but, but you know, people are working from home a lot more today. Um, you know, you had uh, cars parked an average of 17 hours a day. You had them plugged in an average of 12 hours a day, and you had them charging three hours a day, right? So when they're charging within that 12 hour period can fluctuate depending on what the grid, um, uh, wants to see on managed charging to be able to keep infrastructure costs down, right? And so the last thing I would say is that 5% of everyone's electricity bill is spent on these natural gas peaker plants and flexibility services, right? And so if consumers are willing to provide those services, paying them intentionally, right, instead of paying a natural gas peaker plant is something you can do. Now there's safety protocols. We got to make sure that um, people are comfortable, but also that we have enough uh, loads that have have opted in. Right? You can't shave three met, uh, sorry, three gigawatts of load with three gigawatts of demand. You probably need like a four to one safety factor. So you probably need twelve thousand megawatts of load that you're controlling to deliver three thousand uh, megawatts reliably. But that's actually not that hard. And particularly when you're doing a replacement cycle, which the Inflation Reduction Act provides for today. There's a lot of money in there for heat pumps, a lot of money in there for maintenance, weatherization, et cetera. So when you think about visiting people's homes, which you're going to do for these programs, you can also register these homeowners into or residents into virtual power plants and you know really take a dig once approach where you really sign people up to all of these uh, services that they can be uh, paid for. So where does the financing come in? Why are new types of financing needed to enable these types of technologies? Well, I mean, I would start by saying that people already use financing, mm -hmm. right? We buy $120 billion a year worth of household appliances and or HVAC upgrades, right? Because things break. Um, of that 120 billion a year, 43, sorry, 43% 43 of it, so roughly 50 billion of it, is low moderate income, right? Those people already, when things break, go to a local provider, probably pay $100 too much for the appliance, 
and agree to 12 to 14 percent interest financing for two years to finance it. So it's not like they're not already financing it. So today, because of the uh, the innovation and success of the private markets, right, where they're already funding something on the order of three billion dollars a month of solar plus storage, heat pumps, other types of devices, whether it's through uh, unsecured financing, utility on bill financing mechanism, pays models, pace models. There's lots of financing already happening, but that, those financing parties are not actually talking to LMI customers, even though they can actually provide a much lower interest rate than the net net, you know, double digit interest rates that those um, LMI customers are paying now for, you know, frankly, a risk profile that's quite reasonable and manageable. And so, a lot of what we're doing is really linking the innovative financing models that are already, you know, uh, growing very rapidly and making sure that low moderate income consumers have access to those same exact financing sources. And when you do that, you're taking this dig one approach, right? So you're saying, look, we're going to finance a new heat pump water heater for them or a new refrigerator for them or a new heat pump for them or, or solar plus storage. But while you're doing it, you also register people into virtual power plants and other programs that they qualify for, which, as you know, many low moderate income households don't register for programs that they qualify for. And mm -hmm. so at this moment of intervention, you can actually help folks not only get an affordable interest rate for something they were going to finance anyway, but you could also help them register for all these programs, including virtual power plants. That's great. Darren, do you have thoughts on, on financing? Well, you know, I think what Jigger said is obviously spot on. Um, you know, I've got a chance to work in the DR space earlier in my career. So I think, you know, one of the things as you look at the net zero goals and sustainability goals going forward is just the importance of the demand side of the equation. Needless to say, resources represent a big part of what needs to happen for the clean energy transition. But the demand side of the equation still represents 20, 25%, depending on, on how you look at it in terms of being able to really achieve the goals. And I think demand response plays an important role, all to the reasons what Jigger described in terms of creating opportunities, looking for kind of the type of appliances that are out there, the financing that's available. There is a lot of really good economic incentive for participation by consumers and businesses in those programs. It benefits them economically. It benefits the way, you know, from an energy management and optimization standpoint, there's benefits from that as well, as well as grid management. I also think those programs help from a capital standpoint for utilities, right? All that technology kind of comes into play in different ways that really helps with the transition, but helps optimize it in a way that creates it, makes it affordable, right? And creates those incentives. So when you look at things like DR programs from a broader perspective, industry-wide, making them available across all the territories, right? Having them be a part of different, you know, from all from an energy standpoint, as well as in open markets. I mean, that's going to be an important next step. And obviously the engagement aspect, things that we do at Smart Energy Water falls into line with what Jigger said in terms of education, awareness, enrollment, right? That's an important component of it, but availability as well, right? There's a lot of strong benefits that come with a program like that. And we're going to need to have it in place as we look going forward. Yeah, I, I like both of your points of going to the, the consumers and, and doing the work, some of the work for them at least, um, especially since there are going to be so many more new programs available with the IRA funds, et cetera. So thank you for that. Um, Jigger, what types of companies have been coming to you, um, you know, with new ideas or, or what types of companies should be coming to you? Yeah, no, look, I think that um, anyone and everyone is more than welcome to come to our office from growth companies who are venture capital back to established utilities um, and uh, Fortune 500 companies. I mean, so we're seeing lots of folks who come in. I'd say that we're um, we're maintaining a database of roughly 1,100 companies that have come to us and are actively engaged with our office. Others have come in just to, you know, get a quick download of our programs, but there are some that are actively working with us, and that's about 1,100 companies. 
um, of which um, 98 of them have actually filled out a loan application, which takes hundreds of hours worth of work, you can imagine. Um, our average loan size that they're requesting is roughly a billion dollars, right? So we have 98 active applications seeking $104.5 billion worth of proceeds. Um, and so we're pretty, we're at scale. So most of the companies who've come to us, even the small ones, have raised at least $100 million worth of corporate equity. Mm -hmm. Right, so these are folks who've gone through a C round, uh, sometimes a D round, or even SPAC the company in Republic now on the on the stock exchange. Um, and even there, right, those are the companies that I think most people believe are mature companies. Many of those companies haven't actually done a lot yet, right? And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Like when you think like when Tesla went public, I think it was roughly 2012. You know, they were selling a few thousand cars a month. Right. So it wasn't a lot. Right. So you could imagine that they weren't um, yet um, having this huge impact on people. So a lot of these companies are where Tesla was in 2012, where they had a working Model S, which is great, that served a you know, sort of wealthier demographic. And they were looking to move towards a much lower um, uh, you know, cost. And so so that, you know, that is something that we're very interested in, in helping these companies achieve. Great. Darren, from the utility perspective, how can they kind of leverage some of these new financing mechanisms to better serve their customers? No, oh, that's a great question. I mean, if you think historically, right, some of these larger programs help facilitate the rollout of AMI infrastructure, right, in the industry over you know, over a decade ago, and even in some cases, kind of the continuation of that today. So now what we're seeing with the infrastructure bill is the ability to do something similar across EV infrastructure and some of the other clean energy technologies that we've talked about earlier. And I think it's going to be really important to help drive adoption. I mean, I think one of the things utilities can do is they work with providers, work with partners on the technology side, help demonstrate the demand side of that equation, kind of what Tajigar said, right? Some of these companies, even though they've gone through a series of rounds, they're still not quite, they're not rich scale yet, right? The commercialization of the project product is still in progress. So as utilities demonstrate interest in new technologies, that helps early stage startups get a position to be able to go out and grab the funding, get the proceeds they need to help with scale and commercialization of the project. I think the same thing applies on the resourcing side, right? There's going to be a lot of private private public partnerships that are going to be needed to do as we look at the broader transition that's happening down the road. When you look at the capital required from a transition clean energy transition standpoint, and we're going to need to work together, right? We're going to need to work across in, across industry, across organizations, public and private, to be able to help support that as we're moving forward, because that's going to be an important part that's going to be driving progress. So on that note, how can people get in touch with you, Jigger, if they're looking looking to get a loan from the loan programs office? Well, the our website is very active, right? So that's um, the loan programs office website at the Department of Energy. And so I would definitely check that out. We post blogs every week or so. So we get all sorts of, you know, weird questions, interesting questions where people say, hey, have you thought about funding this? Or could you do this? Or could you do that? And we answer them all for everyone to see um, on the blog. So your question may have been asked by somebody else. And so you should definitely check that out. And then through that, there's a way to get in touch with our outreach and business development team. Um, but we're also active on LinkedIn and Twitter and, and et cetera. And so, you know, folks can reach out to us there. Uh, but we're very excited uh, to serve the broader community, including utility companies. I think when you think about the new 1706 program that we were given, um, a lot of those funds, you know, which is almost $250 billion worth of loan authority, are, are going to be used by utility companies to modernize their existing energy infrastructure. Great. Well, thank you both so much for joining today. I hope some people in our We3 audience will be reaching out to you both and um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of the event. Thank you all. Well, thanks for thank having you. me.